I'd like to tell you a true story about a few extraordinary but unknown individuals. They were my great uncle John and my great aunts Martha and Ann. They were born into an immigrant family with ten other brothers and sisters, most of whom died very early in life. John, Martha, and Ann spent their childhoods in the Great Depression and worked very hard to help the family sustain itself. They entered their adult lives unmarried and with simple service type jobs which had fairly modest pay. Knowing how expensive housing could be and how important a family support structure was, the three of them decided to buy a modest brownstone and lived in it all together. Of course, space was quite tight, they never had enough room to entertain large crowds, but they always had a roof over their heads. Fast forward to the period of time when I knew them, which was the 1980s and 1990s. They were still unmarried at the time, and quite a bit older. They had retired at that point, and were drawing on pensions and social security, both of which they had paid into their entire lives. John loved baseball. He rarely spent money to go to games, but always had the game on TV when I visited. He always had a smile on his face and a very pleasant demeanor, especially when he was watching baseball. He passed away in the 1980s, leaving behind Anne and Martha. Both Anne and Martha were equally kind, and despite living in such a modest setting, were always quick to offer food and good company to visitors. This was especially true of Martha, whose existence, it seemed, revolved around providing service to others. That's what made her happy. Anne had severe knee problems, which limited her mobility. The family had talked her into uh, knee reconstruction surgery. She couldn't deal with the pain resulting from the surgery and failed to do the physical therapy exercises. And this completely destroyed her mobility. And she died in the mid to late 1990s. Martha followed shortly thereafter. It seems someone whose purpose it is to care for others can lose their will to live when they run out of people to serve. When they died in the late 1990s, my uncle, who was at that point a financial planner, and my mother, both became aware of what they had left behind. It seems that over the course of their lives, despite having very meager jobs, they had managed to save several million dollars in bank CDs. There were different reactions from people in my family upon learning the news. Some were focused on how much of that money they were going to receive and what they would spend it on. Some were working out the tax consequences. Some were outraged at the lost opportunity and even mentioned to me that the fortune left behind would have been worth much more had they consulted a financial planner and invested the money in the stock market instead of bank CDs. I personally sat on the news for a while thinking about how three very humble people of modest means could have accomplished what they had. Now I know that you're all wondering at this point in the story if I inherited any of the money. And the answer is no, I didn't. I was far too down the line. What I did receive from them though is much more valuable. And that is the secret to building wealth, which is part of the story. Now this is not where the story ends. I need to share with you what the heirs of the fortune did with the money. A significant amount of the money was spent on nice cars and vacations. Those cars and vacations are now gone and forgotten, much like those who left behind the money, I'm afraid. The rest was invested according to the principles taught by financial planners at the time. The money was invested in the stock market in the late 1990s. The following years were not very kind to stock investors, and the heirs of the fortune, who had expressed consternation that the money had been in CDs, learned that stocks are not a sure thing. Some of them threw in the towel on stocks in the mid-2000s and invested what money remained in real estate, thinking that real estate was a guaranteed way to build wealth. They were disappointed, again, though this time they found that because they took out mortgages on the properties that they actually lost more than they had invested in the first place. And this brings me to the end of my story. Are there lessons embedded in this story? I think there are many. The most important lesson is that there are two approaches to building wealth. There is the slow and steady path where one lives modestly and saves surplus income every month, month after month, for long periods of time. This approach relies upon the personal characteristics of industry, frugality, modesty, and tenacity. Over time, it can be very powerful. In fact, the outcome from such a process can surprise and confound financial experts. 
I don't think it matters so much what asset is accumulated, provided there is a reasonable assurance that in the long term, the item will retain its value. John, Anne, and Martha could have just as easily have used precious metals, short-term treasury bonds, savings bonds, or annuity, or a combination of all of these, <laughs> any of the items that are traditionally scoffed at by the financial industry. It doesn't matter. It's more the attitude taken by the saver that's the hallmark of the approach, not the assets that are accumulated, provided that they are conservatively chosen. Then there is the fast approach, where one buys things that one believes will increase in value in the short term. Great wealth is promised, and great wealth can be had, but it can't be counted on, nor can a person count on finishing with even as much wealth as he or she started with. And it has to be this way, otherwise nobody would need to work, and that's just not realistic. But this is the approach that many of us adopt. We want it to work, and we hope it will work. We gamble our futures in the hopes that wealth will accumulate without the need to sacrifice. Meanwhile, the John, Anne, and Marthas of the world quietly and steadily build a fortune that only they know how to keep.